this is the space that I inherited. Um, the cows have left, but it was originally built in the 30s as a milking shed. Uh, unfortunately, we, we have a 1760s farmhouse and uh, the original farm barn used to be just to the right of this. I, I never ever saw it. It fell down many, many years ago. Um, but in the 30s, the farmers decided to get out of the apple business and into the uh, into the milking business and constructed this barn. And the area I want you to pay particular attention to um, are really the um, the leftmost four windows on the ground floor because the ground floor is about uh, 1,600 square feet. And I made the decision to basically cut that in half and make the left hand side of this uh, my woodworking shop, with the front half being for um, for engine work and uh, now a lot of motorcycle work as well in there. Um, so I was starting off, I gave myself about 800 square feet and I felt like that was going to be absolutely enormous. Um, I wanted to be able to adapt the, the workspace to suit my needs and what I inherited um, as the starting point um, was Whilst it had been a milking shed, it hadn't been a, a milking shed for about 30 years, and it had been used a lot for um, horses, for goats, for chickens, and I think in later years before we moved in, for general storage and dumping. I ended up moving a 19th century newspaper hand guillotine, which is still in the shop because it's so heavy to move anywhere. If anybody wants one, it's free for the taking. I would love if somebody knew how to use that thing and, uh, and, and, and please take it away. Um, I had a couple of leaking 55 gallon drums of driveway sealant um, and these are, I discovered were not the easiest things to get rid of. I had countless filing cabinets, metal desks. I got more than 2,000 board feet of pre-used lumber lying in the shop. Um, and possibly worst of all, I acquired a four fuse breaker box inside the shop on a 20 amp breaker from the house, um, which was buried with the, uh, the delivery wire was buried about an inch below the grass on the right hand side of the picture. Um, so there was a lot of things that would have to change. And I started thinking about what I wanted to achieve in the shop. Now, uh, we kind of termed this about, be, for me, for being about hybrid woodworking. And I guess we should just define what hybrid means in this context. I kind of think about it as using the tool that makes the most sense for me for a particular task. So whilst um, I work with George and, and Mike on helping to run the hand tools group, I'm by no means a hand tool only woodworker. Like many of you, um, I, I use a real mix. And hybrid is really just thinking about things in that context. I make furniture, I do a lot of cabinets, I do some wood turning. Um, so things from small boxes, solstice ornaments, all those kind of classic things that we all seem to end up doing, um, all the way up to I think the biggest thing I built is probably about uh, eight feet long and seven feet high, um, with uh, basically as a as a cabinet for the inside of our pantry and our kitchen. Um, and I've, I've built various other things of, of pretty big dimensions. So I'm big and small in terms of what I like to build. Um, so. I was trying to get a shop that felt right for me, and this kind of surprised George when we were talking about it. Um, that he, really, when I started explaining just how much time I started thinking about this at the beginning, and I think this is important. Um, the more work you can do, I like the Picasso quote about have an idea of what you want, but leave yourself some flexibility. I did try to think about um, that I wanted not just a physical place to work, but I wanted a place where I could sit and think and contemplate as well as a space for work. Um, and I was trying to remember, and I think this is important for all of us, we can lose sight of the fact that the space is supposed to be for our own enjoyment as well as a place to go and do work. Uh, so I kind of defined it as a power tool shop in which I wanted to work and a hand tool shop in which I wanted to hang out, um, but to try and make both a safe and healthy place. Now, a little later, Tony's going to talk about some, some books that uh, between us we've recommended um, and one of those I would particularly draw your attention to is Woodshop Dust Collection. Um, Sandor, I forget his last name, but we'll talk about it later. Um, there's a very good book, there are several available on dust collection. And I tried to make this an integral part of what I was thinking about in designing the shop. Um, 
being married to a physician makes you very aware of when you're doing dangerous things and possibly the, one of the most dangerous things we do every day when we walk in the shop is, is create dust. Um, so I wanted to make that a priority. So this is what um, the design started to turn into. Um, I've used a, a, a SketchUp file here. Um, what we're doing is looking at the shop from the western wall. We're peering through the western wall. Um, and the door you see on the, the left-hand side um, at the back, behind the table saw, if that makes sense, um, is going into the, the rest of the shop. That's where my metalworking stuff is. Um, so what we see is on the left-hand side of the shop here, an area dedicated towards, uh, towards power tools, and an area on the right that's more dedicated towards hand tools. Although there's a kind of a transition point where my Festo multifunction tables end up becoming that uh, hand tools, you, oh, sorry, power tools that you hold in your hand uh, kind of fill in the middle. And that, that actually works for me as a, as a good transition. Um, what I haven't shown here on the right hand side of the picture where the, um, the workbench is, is the four windows that you were looking at in the previous picture. I just didn't put them in this design when I drew it. But the decision I made here was to give my hand tools, the, those four windows, and the south-facing view, um, and to give my power tools the most height I had available. Because I felt that that big door you see in the background, that's where the, the wood was generally going to come in from, especially if I was doing anything with um, eight by four panels. Um, they would be going to table saw and such like to get broken down, which is why we start there. So the workflow thought. Um, was driven from that, and um, and and so I had the most need for height there as well. And if you move around large pieces of wood, know this problem. So this is the inside of the shop. Um, once we've actually improved it a bit, um, the wall you see on the left-hand picture was actually knocked off its foundation by the horses that used to be in the barn, partly because to give the horses more headroom, one of the support trusses trusses had been removed. Uh, from the ceiling, and that allowed the whole thing to just swing off the foundation. So we, I got help with a professional to bring it back into square, put it back in the foundation. But I, uh, myself and my wife, dug out these floors, which it turned out were full of up to two feet of a mix of basically clay and straw and horseshit um, that had formed a very, very substantial floor. Now, maybe in hindsight, I should have just taken that as a level, but I decided to go back to concrete. And you can see that what we discovered once we shoveled it all out was that there's not a single surface in the concrete floor that's actually level. Um, and that's because it's an old milking shed. Everything's designed to drain in different directions. So that was going to be a challenge uh, from a woodworking point of view and having a nice flat floor. And I knew I did not want to work on concrete from my experience in a garage shop. Um, the left hand side gives you a picture on, on kind of what it was like mid demolition. Sorry, the right-hand side on mid-demolition. I actually uh, contracted with somebody to remove uh, the the flooring on the on that side after I'd, I'd done the other side by hand, um, and it turned out that a jackhammer was really the, the tool rather than a pickaxe. So some things you just learn along the way. Um, so we took out the old stalls, um, we rebuilt the north wall, we replaced all of the vertical supports, we replaced the missing beams and um, we put in a new electrical supply to the whole building. And then a jump forward to what did we get to in terms of building to the plan? Well, um, you can see that by this stage, we've got a new sill on the floor. We've got the framing for the new windows for the north wall done, but the new beam on the ceiling to help support that. Um, and in fact, I've done some of the installation in the ceiling on the right-hand side. You can see the new wall that I built on the left-hand side of the left-hand picture. And you can see the new floor that I put in. Uh, and if you notice, you may be wondering why um, on the left-hand picture, why my floor has this little channel running along it. I had this really bright idea that I would use um, the drainage channels in the concrete underneath the floor here to run all of my dust work for the, for the dust collection. Um, now, it turned out not to be the plan, and that's about keeping your options open. Um, this channel has been useful. I've actually run some electric conduit in it, um, but it hasn't been used for my original purpose. It was quite a lot of extra work to create this as a set of removable panels. So I still need to think about 
possibly preparing for the apocalypse with some uh, underground storage there or something. Um, but we've got new siding, new windows, new insulation. Um, the floor is fully insulated. I put it on raised pressure treated beams and insulated between all of those with a vapor barrier. Um, we've got a partition wall. I stained and finished the, the floor. We repainted a lot of the woodwork. Um, and I designed and installed the lighting and the electrical system myself. Now, not all of the electrical system is in at this point. We start to see the lighting. Um, I went for LEDs with everything here. Um, this was about the point when LEDs were becoming a serious option. Um, there's some various opinions on what is the best color to go with. I think you'll have to work that out for yourself. Um, and I know there's some ophthalmologist views that the blue uh, daylight tinges can be uh, taken with some caution. Um, I went for hanging pendants to be very classic in the hanging part, higher part of the shop and very flush LEDs uh, in the circular lights you see in the lower part of the shop just to give me head, headroom. I've got to tell you, six years into this being finished, I'm on me very, very happy um, with using the LEDs and the natural daylight. Um, that has worked out really, really well. And obviously, I haven't had to replace any bulbs, which is always nice. I, you'll notice also that I did all of my electrical work with um, metal conduit on the outside. Um, and I know this is not always the most popular thing. I discovered that bending pipe is um, a skill to be learned. Um, I definitely did not get that beautifully done all the, all the time. I got better at it as I went. Um, but the reason I did this, I wanted to have easy access should I want to change things, and this was about being flexible, and I wanted to be uh, very sure that um, recognizing I'm in a barn, I do share it sometimes with chipmunks and squirrels and probably a couple of mice, um, although I try to keep all that under control, that I did not want my wires getting chewed out by some rodents, so everything is in metal conduit. Um, so, it is a woodworking shop, so let's get to some tools in there. So in with the new. Um, so look at the left-hand picture just now. Still looking pretty spacious. It looks pretty much like the original design at this point. I've got my festival tables. You've got my uh, Rubo workbench on the right-hand side. I've got a nice chair to sit at. Um, if you look beyond the chair up on the wall there, I've got my first heating system. Now, this barn is not heated regularly and so I made this essentially as close to a thermal envelope as I could within the barn and just tried to heat this space um, and that's a uh, basically a 30 kilowatt to 40 volt electrical heater you can pick them up for about 300 bucks to somewhere between two and four hundred online um, and it's uh, basically a heating coil with a fan and you look at the space it's nearly 800 square feet the ceiling gets up to nearly 14 feet at one point um, this thing can heat that shop to a very comfortable, um, certainly above 60 degrees in the winter, uh, if I chose to run it all the time. Now, I actually use a couple of oil-filled little radiators to maintain above freezing at all times now, um, and that doesn't cost me too much on my electrical bill. And then I turn the fan heater on when I get in the shop, and I, within half an hour or an hour, um, it can be more than a comfortable temperature. So that's something um, that doesn't need to be um, a huge thing. If we ever move to propane in the house, I may put in a different system, but that is cheap and affordable to install, obviously with slightly higher running costs. Um, so recognizing that on the left-hand side, um, on the overall picture, we kind of achieved my design. What, we, what I realized was there were some things, um, and this is talk about a changing world that starts to impinge upon your design. Um, I did not anticipate everything. I did not anticipate just how many woodworking books I really owned and how much storage I needed for those. I did not anticipate just how many hand tools I would keep buying. I did not anticipate that I would develop a penchant for um, old woodworking toolboxes and their contents, um, or that I would start buying old Scottish infill planes. And all of those take storage space, which I'm probably low on. And I also um, I originally thought I would store my wood in the front part of the shop, and that turned out not to be good. So I've moved the, all the wood storage inside as well, basically where the jointer is on the very far left of the picture. And that has all impinged upon um, on my design. Um, and that's okay, but you have to live with those consequences. 
on the right hand side, this is sort of as extreme as it gets. I've gone now, this picture was taken um, about a week ago and recognizing the shop's really untidy, but that's my world. I'm not the tiniest of people. I, I, I cope with that. Um, you see my Rubu bench has got a lot of tools on it just now. Um, I happen to be working on reskinning uh, a 100 year old bass drum for the Amherst Town Band. So that's in the shop just now. I decided having a workbench um, that was dedicated to, to sharpening would be a good plan. So hence you see another workbench uh, behind my Rubo one that is getting used for sharpening. And I acquired, um, or was given rather, uh, a very nice Lee Valley workbench that somebody decided they didn't want to use anymore. Um, and so I wasn't going to turn that down. And I've discovered that actually having um, at least three active workbenches side by side like this is really, really nice. Now, it means I've given up some space, um, but I'm prepared to live with that. And that's just recognizing that your needs will, will change as you go along. So recognizing that needs evolve, that's also been the case um, in my, in my uh, power tool side of things. I did not originally plan for two band saws, which I now have. Um, and that's really useful. I'm able to run one with a big blade, one with a very thin blade. Don't have to do the setups all the time. Um, I originally had a Delta contractor saw, which I hope to upgrade to a saw stop. I was very fortunate to be given a saw stop, um, but it came with a huge outfeed table, which was probably bigger than I would have ever picked. But when it's free, it's a good deal. Um, so I've accommodated that. Um, I've also um, upgraded my planer. I originally had a rigid one, and I have a 15-inch jet, and I have an 18-inch jet belt sander. Um, I talked about all the hand tool additions I have. Um, and my dust collection system came in. So just to, to talk about dust collection for a minute, I'd always planned to have full dust collection in the shop. This picture was actually taken kind of mid-install. And you can see the main trunk running along the ceiling. So I didn't end up using the channels in the floor after doing all the work to create them. This raised version um, was at the uh, design recommendation of Oneida in upstate New York. Now, I got my dust collector from Oneida and all of the quick disconnect dust collection uh, piping from them. Now, I know a lot of folks is, uh, shy away from this stuff because it's a lot more expensive and realistically it is. But for those of us who are um, not experts in installing dust collection and are not exactly sure that they want to design their shop and rivet all the dust collection together for once and forever. Um, this quick disconnect dust collection system, I think is fantastic. Now you're gonna make your own choice on that. Um, I gotta say it was an absolute cinch to install and it has been flexible for me as I have changed my needs. Um, I did the initial layout work and my suggestions with the Oneida people, and I used their design service to work out the technical details. And they give you um, basically a refund on the design cost if you buy the dust collection from them. And uh, it was a good enough deal that that was the way I decided to go. Now you'll notice in this dust collection picture, there isn't a dust collector. And one of the decisions I made was actually to put my dust collector in the other side of the shop, in the, the non-woodworking uh, non bit of it partly to get the noise out of my uh, my shop, um, and also just to make use of the space I had in a corner where I could fit the dust collector. Um, for those of you interested, the reason I did not use the floor uh, tunnel for the dust collection um, was that the Oneida folks were concerned about going from a ground level up to basically a, a close to an eight feet height at the very end, just before they went into the dust collector, the cyclone itself, they thought it was better to stay high. And uh, frankly, this gives easy access and it probably made the turns less severe as well. So that all worked. Um, and I think, um, yeah, those are the main points I wanted to get across. I think I covered everything there 